Welcome back. In this video, I'll be introducing the basics of short-term financing. I'll use several examples and walk us through the cash cycle. This lecture is essentially the first of a two-part lecture. While we'll cover the short-term financing in this video, in the next video I'll discuss how to manage short-term assets and ensure accounts receivable are paid by your customers. So why should you know about short-term cash management? Well, it's because everyone in a business should have some knowledge of how cash moves through an organization. If you're a salesperson, you should know about the impact of certain types of sales and their impact on cash flow of a firm. If you're a manager, you should absolutely understand why stockouts or liquidity issues are so damaging to a firm's bottom line and solvency. To get us started in short-term financing, I'll introduce both the operating cycle and the cash cycle. Then I'll drill down into detail on the cash cycle. Next, I'll discuss the pros and cons of different asset financing policies. Then I'll talk about the most common types of short-term financing. Finally, we'll compute the cost of various forms of short-term financing, essentially going through EAR and APR. Because we're discussing short-term financing, which involves a firm raising cash, let's talk about the relationship that other line items have on the cash position of a firm. Cash can be calculated using the formula I have here. So just cash is equal to whatever you've borrowed, so long-term debt, uh, whatever stuff, cash you've raised via equity, and any current liabilities you've had, all of those are going to raise cash for you. And then if you're using that cash for other current assets like inventory production, or maybe you are using that cash to buy a production facility or a, uh, a piece of land, that's going to take cash away from your cash item on your balance sheet. Now, all we're doing here is adding up the items on the right-hand side of the balance sheet and subtracting the increases in the other current and fixed assets on the left side of the balance sheet. Let's take a look at an example that illustrates why your cash position is important. So in this example, I decided to use a company that I'm very familiar with, uh, Java Hote in Terre Haute. So the manager of Java Hote purchases three tons of cocoa beans from Columbia. The manager has five days left to pay for these beans. And last night, the manager realized the firm does not have enough cash on hand to pay off its accounts payable. How could the manager resolve this problem? Well. Java Hope could do several things. First, it could sell off some fixed assets in order to raise cash. Uh, the drawback there is that fixed assets take a fairly long time to sell, so maybe that's that five-day period is not enough time. Uh, the firm could also get a loan from a bank or issue bonds to investors. I would say that probably a loan would be the most likely alternative here. Or it could also raise it could also run a promotion to raise cash quickly with a low profit margin. Uh, there's a couple of drawbacks to doing that but that's definitely a possibility. So what I'm trying to say here is there's a lot of things the manager of Java Hope could do, but the best thing is to hopefully never find yourself in this situation. So the question is, how do we do that? The answer is to follow sh standard working capital management practices and mind the amount of liquidity available. So working capital management is the management of short-term assets and liabilities. A firm's working capital policy refers to their decisions regarding the target levels for each current asset and current liability. The policy is closely tied to two cycles we often refer to, the operating cycle and the cash cycle. Let's talk about each of them in turn. We'll start with the operating cycle. The operating cycle indicates the time from which you, you receive your raw materials until the time that you are paid by your customers in cash. Now, if we can find a way to shorten the operating cycle, then we can reduce the amount of debt we need to issue and we can uh, we might be able to get better credit terms from our suppliers and then use the additional money for additional capital budgeting projects. Let's walk through the operating and cash cycles. This is how inventory would move through a firm which takes in inputs and produces a finished good. First, you place the order for an input and eventually receive the input. At that point in time, if you haven't received the bill, you would probably receive that bill. Uh, the inventory period is going to be the time between receiving the stock and selling it. So just this period here. This is proxied for by using the inventory turnover measure, which we'll talk about. Our accounts receivable period is just the average amount of time until we receive payment for our sale. With firms like Java Hote that sell coffee and pastries, 
the accounts receivable period is, is going to be very short. The entire operating cycle tells us how long we're taking from the time that we receive our stock until that time we get paid cash by our customers. If we're paid in cash, we probably won't need to borrow as much to pay our suppliers, assuming we can get good credit terms from them. Now, there are a number of terms we can use to calculate the length of the operating cycle. Let's go through them. We've talked about a couple of these formulas already, uh, but let's just review them. All right, so to calculate the operating cycle, what we're going to need to do is start off calculating the inventory turnover of the firm. So that's just our cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. So a lot of times what we'll use is inventory at the end of the year, say the, the fiscal year, plus the average inventory at the beginning of the year divided by two, essentially trying to get an average me measure here. Then another measure that's going to be very important to us is the inventory conversion measure. Uh, why? Well, it's really one of the two periods that we're going to be used to calculate the calculating the operating cycle. So we're going to take this inventory turnover measure and divide it into 360 because there's really 360 days in a year that are not major holidays. So this is why some people will use 360. Others will actually use 365. Uh, really, what's more important whether you use 360 or 365 is to make sure you're consistent uh, anytime you use this measure, just because you don't want some calculations for inventory conversion period to be 360 and some uh, calculated using 360 and some to be calculated using 365. As long as you're consistent, it really shouldn't matter. Uh, now our accounts receivable turnover tells us how many times a year our accounts receivable will, will completely turn over. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the sales revenue from sales where the sale was made on credit. In other words, our customer has bought the item, but they still have to pay the what they owe in cash at a later date. And we're gonna divide that by the average accounts receivable. So, uh, so just sales revenue divided by accounts receivable, and our AR period is going to be that number, that receivable's turnover, divided into 360. Again, same as the inventory conversion period. And the sum of these two periods is going to be our operating cycle. All right, let's look at an example where we can calculate the operating cycle. In the real world, we can calculate these line items from the balance sheet and income statement at any point in time. Uh, when we calculate these numbers, it's always best to calculate these ratios based on average numbers over the course of the year. And you might be asking why? Well, it's because if we're only using accounts payable at one point in time or accounts receivable at one point in time, this point in time may not be representative of the actual turnover uh, or uh, period. So what we often like to do is if we have, let's say, a number like inventory on the balance sheet, what we're going to do is we're going to take the, let's say, the inventory at the end of this fiscal year and average it with the inventory on the balance sheet in the end of the last fiscal year. And that's how we'd get some of these numbers if we wanted to do it uh, more accurately than just taking the number, the number directly off the last balance sheet. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate the inventory conversion period, and then we'll calculate the accounts receivable period, and finally we'll calculate the operating cycle. So to do this, I'm going to move over to, over to Excel. I've moved over, moved over to Excel, and here's the information we have for this example. We have our data up here. I've posted the formulas so you can follow along pretty easily down here. Uh, these are more formulas than we'll really need. And over here, I'm going to calculate the turnover period, turnover period operating cycle. Uh, so let's get started. So our inventory turnover is just going to be our cost of goods sold, in this case, 7,000 divided by our average inventory. And in this example, I'm just gonna assume that our 750 is the average inventory of this firm, Java Hote, for this period. And so our inventory turnover is 9.33. That tells us that this firm turns over all of its inventory on its shelves uh, about 9.33 times a year. Obviously, this is not going to be a realistic example. I literally just made these numbers up. All right, next. Uh, our inventory period, all we're going to do is take our inventory turnover and divide it into 360. And that's going to tell us the average number of days it takes us to sell all of our inventory. So about 38 
0.57 days. All right, next, let's get our accounts receivable turnover. So in this case, we're going to be taking the sales revenue or credit sales revenue, I should say, divided by accounts receivable. And the issue here is that a lot of times when you're calculating this number, not all of these sales are going to be credit. Uh, I mean, some people will pay cash, people will pay it immediately. And so the issue with this number or this ratio a lot of times is that you won't ever, you won't often have the total credit sales revenue. So a lot of times what people will do is just go ahead and use total sales revenue. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to use that 10,000 and divide it by our accounts receivable of 500 and get a grand total of 20. Next, we'll get our period, our AR period. So we're going to divide that 20 into 360. And this accounts receivable period of 18 tells us it takes us, on average, 18 days to get paid by our customers, which is, again, unrealistic. This would be more consistent with, oh, maybe a... a uh, B2B firm that sells something directly to other uh, other businesses. All right, let's just go ahead and calculate the operating cycle. And the operating cycle is just going to be our AR period plus our inventory period. And we get 56.57 days. Now, what that really means is that this entire process from the time when your stock arrives or your raw inputs arrive until you receive cash from your customers this for our sample firm, Java Hope, is about 56.57 days. Now, the shorter this is, the better for us because generally we, we don't want to be languishing and waiting a long time to receive, to receive our cash that we're owed by our buyers. So now we know how long the operating cycle is and how to calculate it. Now, the other cycle we often refer to is the cash cycle. And arguably, the, this is the most important part of the operating cycle. The cash cycle is the time from when you, your firm pays for materials until that time that your firm is paid by customers. So if your firm is paid at the end of the accounts payable period here, the cash cycle would be the time that it takes you to get cash from your customers. And that gap is usually a big concern because we have to fund our accounts payable using something. Uh, sometimes that's, that's gonna be short-term debt. All right, to put it a little more formally, the cash cycle tells us the number of days between when we have to pay our creditors and when we receive payment for the sales we have. The shorter this period, the better. The cash cycle represents a combination of three components. The first is the time until the, the inventory is sold or the inventory conversion period. And we're gonna add to that the Days sales outstanding, which I'll talk about here in a second, basically it's our, our AR period, uh, which indicates the amount of time you until you get paid for the inventory you sold. And we're going to sub subtract the days payables outstanding. Uh, that's one that we haven't talked about yet. Basically, that's our accounts payable period that you saw earlier in this graph. And that's going to indicate the amount of time it takes for you to pay for the inputs that you purchased. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to be adding this period and this period and then subtracting this period. And the reason I have a couple of different acronyms here, ICP, DSO, DPO, even though some of these are not uh, obviously DSO or DPO, uh, generally there's a lot of names for these periods. So that's, that's why I'm kind of being a little loosey-goosey with these. All right, let's talk about each of these three periods in turn. Now, the inventory conversion period is the average length of time it takes you to uh, convert materials into finished goods and then sell those goods. So we've already talked about two of these formulas uh, or two, two formulas related to this period. But let's just go through and mention that, that big formula again. So our ICP is going to be inventory divided by cost of goods sold per day. Or we can rearrange this using one of these other formulas and get inventory divided by cost of goods sold off of the income statement divided by 360. Or if we really wanted to, we could just rearrange this completely and do 360 divided by inventory turnover, which is what we saw already. Uh, essentially, this is going to be our same formula that we had a few seconds ago. 
Now, the receivables collection period, sometimes you will hear it referred to as the accounts receivable period or the day's sales outstanding. I've already re referred to this as the accounts receivable period. Uh, this is the average length of time it takes to convert the firm's receivables into cash. All we're doing is just taking, uh, let's talk about the easiest formula here, receivables divided by annual credit sales divided by 360, and that'll get us our day's sales outstanding. If you wanted to and you had receivables turnover, we could just take 360 divided by receivables turnover and that would get us there. The payables deferral period, or DPO, that's going to be the average length of time between the purchase of the raw materials and the actual payment for in cash for these materials. And there's a couple of ways that we could calculate this. Uh, typically, we just take accounts payable and divide that by daily credit purchases or just cost of goods sold divided by 360. Or again, we could just rearrange this and calculate it as 360 divided by our payables turnover ratio. Uh, it's up to you. Uh, now, let's go ahead and apply these numbers and using a real example. IBM has an inventory conversion period of 45 days, a receivables collection period of 30 days, and a payables deferral period of 20 days. So what we'll do is we'll actually go through and calculate all three of these parts to this question in turn. So to do this, I'm just going to flip over to Excel. All right, so I'm over in Excel. And here we have the question up here. And to get the cash conversion cycle, all I'm going to do is use that formula that I showed you a few seconds ago. It's just going to be the ICP plus the DSO minus the DPO. So our inventory conversion period here is 45 days. Our day sales outstanding or receivables collection period is 30 days. And our payables deferable, deferral period is 20 days. And so to get our cash cycle, all I'm going to do is just take 45 plus day sales outstanding of 30 days and subtract our 20 days in the DPO. And that'll get us the 55 days of the cash cycle. Now this tells us that this firm, it'll take this firm on average 55 days to get cash after it sells its whatever products it's received. It, in other words, it has a 55 day gap on average between the time it owes its, its suppliers for the inputs and the time it actually receives the cash from its customers. All right, let's answer part B to this question. If IBM's annual sales are 1.8 million and all sales are on credit, what is the average balance in accounts receivable? This question forces us to be a little smart about how we do things. So we know that IBM has 1.8 million in sales and everything's on credit and the firm has a receivables collection period of 30 days. That means it turns over all of its credit, all of its accounts receivable every 30 days. Now, the way we could calculate the average balance in accounts receivable using this information is to just find out how much this firm is earning in sales every single day and then scale that up over 30 days and that will give us our total sales in a, in uh, rece total receivables every 30 days so let's give that a shot so so we know that this firm has annual sales of 1.8 million so i'll put in 1.8 million and we're going to divide that by the 360 days that we see for a year. Uh, remember, we could use 360 or 365, but regardless of which measure, which number we use, we need to be consistent. So that's why I'm using 360 across the board here. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that by 30 because we want to know the average balance in accounts receivable. And our AR collection period or DSO is 30 days. And so if I do this correctly, what we find is that this firm, IBM, has an accounts receivable on its balance sheet of $150,000 on average. 
All right, let's answer question C. How many times per year does IBM turn over its inventory? Okay, so here we know that the inventory conversion period is 45 days. And we also know that the inventory conversion period is equal to 360 divided by inventory turnover. It's one of those formulas I just gave you. Just right here. So actually, I'll copy this formula over so we can use it as we work. All right. So we know ICP for IBM is 45 days, and we can calculate inventory turnover using this formula. To solve for inventory turnover, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange the ICP formula. And so ICP is equal to 360 divided by inventory turnover. This means that inventory turnover is equal to 360 divided by ICP. We're just rearranging that formula. So if we wanted to solve for inventory turnover, all I would do is take 360 divided by our inventory conversion period of 45 days. And that gives us an inventory conversion period of eight days. In other words, it takes us 40, or sorry, eight days to sell our inventory. All right, let's get back to the lecture. The question that is most obvious when we talk about this cash cycle, given the number of formulas I've given you, is why do we care about the length of the cash cycle? Well, it's because the longer our cash cycle, the more cash we have to come up with by borrowing or holding cash on hand, like backup cash on our balance sheet. If we wanted to reduce our dependency on short-term debt and hold less cash on hand, we would need to make some changes to our short-term short financial policy. Our short-term financial policy refers to how a firm manages its short-term assets, or its current assets, and its current liabilities. If we want to cut down on the amount of cash that we need to borrow for short periods of time, we could alter the credit terms we offer our borrowers, aka uh, we would alter our management of accounts receivable. Uh, if we wanted to reduce our reliance on short-term debt to pay our suppliers, we might also issue new equity and raise additional cash that we could keep on our balance sheet. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can adjust our short-term financial policy. Uh, now, different financial managers are going to prefer different financial policies. Some are going to prefer a more flexible or risk-averse financial policy, while others are going to prefer a more restrictive financial policy that reduces the cash cycle. Now, there's a big benefit to reducing the cash cycle, but we would have to give up some nice advantages which come along with more flexible financial policy. All right, so let's dive into the our discussion of how we actually go about developing a firm's short-term financial policy. Now, when we talk about a firm's short-term financial policy, really the big question is the amount of, or I suppose I should say, how much in terms of short-term or current assets should we be funding? Uh, some firms like to hold a large amount of what are called permanent current assets. In other words, current assets like cash or inventory that just stay on the balance sheet year round. Uh, so I guess the, the official definition of permanent current assets refers to current asset balances that remain stable no matter the seasonal or economic conditions. Uh, firms that have stable sales year round need to be able to pay off their accounts payable year round. And that's why those firms will typically have more permanent current assets. On the other hand, firms in cyclical industries like let's say landscaping firms or ski resorts or tourism uh, management companies or basically any company working in the tourism sector. Uh, these firms can see massive swings in sales from month to month. These firms are less likely to want to carry large permanent current asset balances like inventory or cash on hand uh, since some current assets like inventory can get spoiled before they're used or sold. Now, let's look a little deeper at how differences in working capital policies affect firms. We have three 
major current asset financing policies that I have listed here. Uh, let's go through each of them because they each describe a different scenario. And depending on the personality and the desires of the management of a firm, uh, a firm is going to take one of these approaches or something similar to one of these approaches, although these are certainly idealized and the extreme examples. Now, the first example of a current asset financing policy would be this, this maturity matching approach. With this approach, a financing policy that, uh, is going, our financing policy is going to match assets and liability maturities. Now, this is typically considered a moderate current asset financing policy. For example, a firm could use short-term debt that matures in 60 days to fund raw material purchases where it's expected to be paid by customers within 60 days. It could then use debt with a, let's say, a 10-year maturity to fund purchases of equipment that are expected to last for 10 years. In other words, you're just matching up the maturity of the assets with the maturity of your liabilities. Some firms use a more conservative or a more aggressive approach. The aggressive approach involves financing all of the fixed assets of the firm with long-term capital, but all of the other short-term assets and even some of the, the, the permanent current assets are going to be funded with short-term uh, liabilities like uh, notes payable or a bank loan or something like that. Now, the conservative approach means that the firm finances all asset purchases with long-term capital. Anything that it can finance with long-term capital, it will. Now, the problem with this approach is that firms that follow the conservative approach will have cash and inventory sitting on their balance sheet during off-seasons when they could be using that cash or uh, any other current assets they have uh, for other investment purposes. Uh, now, this is... If we compare this to the aggressive approach, uh, the firm where the firm is only borrowing what they need, uh, this approach would be, this conservative approach would be a little more expensive from a manager's perspective. Uh, it would, however, be less likely that the firm would be unable to pay off its, uh, its suppliers. Now, a firm can use a lot of tools to pursue either of these approaches, the aggressive approach or the conservative approach. But for the remainder of what I have today, I'm going to discuss the tools that firms use to uh, raise short-term short -term debt. Uh, so let's go through some of these. Now, what I have on the screen are a list of short-term funding sources. The first source is often used when a firm pays wages periodically, like every two weeks, or when the firm withholds taxes on sales. It's called accruals. Basically, those, pay those payments, like uh, wages that the firm pays every two weeks, those are going to accrue until they're paid, and they represent short-term liabilities that change depending on whether the firm's operations are expanding or contracting. The next type of short-term financing we have is commercial paper. And commercial paper represents the short-term debt of low-risk firms and has a maximum maturity of 270 days. Uh, now, this short-term debt, this commercial paper, is going to be issued either to the public or privately. And really, the only firms that ever issue commercial paper are firms like Apple or Berkshire Hathaway. And the reason they issue commercial paper is because it's a low-cost method to raise cash for a short amount of time. Next, we have accounts payable, or as it's more commonly known, trade credit. And trade credit is the credit created when one firm buys on credit from another firm. The buyer will have a short amount of time to pay their supplier. And I'll discuss the terms of trade credit in our next, next lecture, although I will be discussing the cost of such trade credit here in a few minutes. The next funding source we have is a short-term bank loan. And short-term bank loans involve a firm entering into some agreement with a commercial bank. There are a lot of these, so let's go through them and the, the common terms in them. And then we'll discuss the secured loans. All right, so short-term bank loans come in many shapes and sizes, but a lot of them are going to have a 90-day maturity. This means that the firm will have 90 days to pay the face value of the loan or just go ahead and try and renew the loan or get a uh, loan renewal from the bank. 
Now, the bank will monitor the firm's credit every time the firm tries to renew the loan. And if the firm's credit rating falls, let's say they're, they're less likely to be able to repay that loan, they might not be able to renew that loan. Now, when the firm signs the loan agreement with the bank, this agreement is sometimes referred to as the promissory note. It identifies the amount borrowed, the interest rate, the repayment schedule, and all of the other terms and conditions associated with the loan. A lot of times, short-term bank loans will also come with a compensating balance. And this compensating balance is a minimum checking account balance that a firm has to maintain with its lender, uh, so that bank that it's borrowing funds from. And usually this balance is going to be between 10 and 20% of the loans outstanding. And you might be wondering why this would exist. Well, it's a way for a bank to make sure that there is something for them to recoup in case the firm that they lent to bails on the loan, just defaults on their loan. Uh, I will say this 10 to 20% compensating balance, this is actually on the lower side if we're looking around the world. I mean, I mentioned Japanese banks in an earlier lecture, but uh, in countries like Japan or Germany, a lot of times this compensating balance will be a lot higher. Now, some bank loans are what we call lines of credit, in which a bank agrees to lend up to a specific amount of funds during a designated period. Sometimes these bank loan, these lines of credit are called revolving lines of credit, or just revolvers for short. And there's a lot of different types of these loans and uh, differences in loan terms, but generally the firm will have to clean up its loan balance at least once a year. In other words, the firm will have to ensure that it owes nothing on its line of credit once a year. Uh, that will be specified in the contract uh, that the bank and the firm sign, but the revolver often comes with what we call a commitment fee. And this fee is charged on the unused balance of the revolving credit agreement. And this compensates the bank for ensuring that the funds will be available for, for this firm when this firm needs it. Uh, so you can imagine if the bank just is waiting for a firm to borrow money and that firm never borrows said money. I mean, that's, that's kind of a bad thing for the bank because it has all this cash sitting on their balance sheet. All right, now the final method of short-term financing I'll discuss is a secured loan. And secured loans are loans backed by collateral, usually inventory or receivables. This means that if the firm borrowing money defaults, the bank is entitled to the firm's accounts receivable or inventory listed in the loan indenture agreement. One of the ways this is done is through the use of factoring, where the firm that defaults on its loan can be forced to sell its receivables to a third party at a discount for cash, and then that cash is used to pay the bank that made the loan. If the bank loan is secured by inventory, this often, uh, then often this loan gives the bank the ability to file a blanket lien against the, the borrowing firm's inventory. This type of lien generally is used when the inventory put up a, for collateral is relatively low priced, fast moving, and difficult to identify individually. Uh, think of a commodity. And examples of this might be anything you would buy at Walmart, although it's obviously unlikely Walmart will default on its secured loans anytime in the near future. Now, if the inventory securing the loan is more high priced or less liquid, then something called a trust receipt is often used. And a trust receipt is an arrangement in which the goods are held in trust for the lender. And goods held in this trust are sold and then proceeds from the sale must be given to the lender to repay a portion of the loan that the firm defaulted on. Now let's talk about how to calculate the costs associated with short-term borrowing. There are many rates I could discuss, but we'll just go ahead and focus on three of them and look at those three rates in a variety of scenarios. The first is the percentage cost per period. And this percentage is just the dollar value or the dollar cost of borrowing. So all of the expenses you pay when you borrow over the period, and that's going to be divided by the dollar amount of usable funds. Now, there are many things I could say about this cost or this, this percentage cost per period, but I'll just try and keep it really simple. Loans will often come with fees plus the quoted interest rate. Now, this numerator is going to capture all of those costs, the, the quoted rate plus any fees, and you'll see this when we get to commercial paper. And 
The denominator here includes only the usable funds borrowed. So if there are any restrictions that prevent the borrower from using the entire amount of a loan, then the effective rate that the borrower is going to pay for the loan is going to be higher than the stated interest rate. And that's how, that's why we use this, this denominator instead of just the amount borrowed. Now, the usable funds can be calculated in several different ways. I'll just show you two of the main ways that they're calculated. So here we have two methods for calculating that denominator in the percentage cost per period. The first way is to just take the principal, the amount that the borrower is borrowing, and subtract any reductions from the principal amount. Uh, so let's say the, the firm has to make a payment on that, that debt immediately. That's going to be, that payment is going to be plugged in right here. Now, at the same time, we can also take the principal, and if we know that, let's say, the firm it, that borrowed that money is only going to be able to use, let's say, 80% of that principal immediately, then what we would do is stick 20% uh, here, and so what we would have is principal times 1 minus 20%, and so our, our usable funds would be 80% of the principal. So that's actually how we, we get that denominator in that first equation right here. Now, the other two formulas, you've certainly already seen the EAR, or effective annual rate, and the APR, or annual percentage rate. Now, the EAR is just our one, the quantity of 1 plus our percentage cost per period to the power of M, which is the number of compounding periods we have, minus 1. And our APR is going to be just our periodic interest rate, so our percentage cost per period, times the number of compounding periods per year. Now this APR, this is what we call a simple interest rate, meaning we're not taking into the we're not taking into account the effects of compounding. That's what we're doing with the EAR, not the APR. Now let's calculate the costs of trade credit. Trade ca trade credit comes with terms like let's say this what I have here, 315 net 45. In this example, this means that the buyer that receives the trade credit has 45 days to pay what they owe to their supplier, but if they can pay what they owe within the first 15 days, then they get a 3% discount on what they owe. The credit received in the 15-day window is referred to as the free trade credit, while the credit taken in excess of the free trade credit is called the costly trade credit because it's called this because its cost is equal to the discount lost when the buyer doesn't pay its bills within this 15-day window. Now let's calculate the percentage cost per period, EAR and APR, of these terms. And to do that, I'll move over to Excel. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to calculate the cost of the costly trade credit, that, that cost of not paying off your bills early. And if you remember our terms for this trade credit were 315 net 45. So 3% discount if you pay in the first 15 days and then no discount if you pay by the time you actually owe your debt. So at the at the end at the end of day 45. Now our percentage cost per period. So this is just going to be this thing that we had all the way back here. It's just our cost of borrowing, dollar cost of borrowing divided by the amount of usable funds. And the way we calculate our percentage cost per period, in this case, it for the costly part of this trade credit, meaning when we lose this discount after day 15, is all we're going to do is we're going to take the three and we're going to divide it by the amount that would be usable in that window between 15 and 45 days. So let's say we borrowed a hundred dollars. I'll just use a hundred. You think of this as a hundred percent if you wanted to. And the problem with this is that we're not going to be able to use that 3% discount. We basically lost that discount. We're going to have to pay that discount. Uh, it, it just disappeared because we, we didn't pay uh, what we owe within the first 15 days. And so we have 100 times uh, 1 minus 0 0.03, and this will give us a percentage cost per period if we pay our, our, 
off our accounts payable between day 15 and day 45 of 3.09%. Now our APR is just going to be this number scaled up to one year. And so this number, this represents the interest rate that we'd be paying over this 15 day window, this 15 to 45 days. So if we wanted to scale it up to an annual percentage rate, what we would have to do is we'd have to take this 3.09 and multiply it by however many times it takes us to get from 30 days to 360 days. Since what we have, or 365 if you wanted to do it that way, but we'll just go ahead and use 360. Uh, so 360 divided by the number of days between 45 and 15. So 45 minus 15, 30 days. Uh, so what that'll get us is so uh, an annual percentage rate or APR of 37.11%. Uh, so what this 3.09% was really telling us is the cost to not t taking the discount before day 15 and instead waiting until day 45 to pay off what we owe. In other words, this is the, the percentage rate that we would pay by simply not exercising the option here to pay off early. Now, our EAR is going to be calculated using that formula I showed you a few minutes ago, just one plus our percentage cost per period to the power of the number of compounding periods we have per year. And the way we're gonna get this is by taking 360 and dividing by 30. Uh, since that'll tell us how many times this 3.09% this interest rate would be compounding over the year. And we'll subtract one to get rid of the principal. And that gives us a, an EAR, or effective annual rate, of 44.12%. So you can see there's a pretty massive difference here between our simple interest rate, our APR, and our effective interest rate, uh, our rate when we compound uh, uh, really not monthly, but every 30 days. So that's that. All right. So now that we've talked about how to calculate the cost of trade credit, assuming you, you don't take the discount within the first period during the, the discount window and instead go to, or wait until the 45 day window expires to pay the trade credit off. Let's talk about some other forms of short-term debt and how we calculate the EAR and APR on those in those in for those forms of debt. All right, the next type of short-term debt issuance we can have is a bank loan. And a bank loan can take three forms, a simple interest loan, a discount loan, or an installment loan. Let's talk about a simple interest loan first. A simple interest loan is a loan in which both the amount borrowed and the interest charge on that amount are paid at maturity. And you're quoted at an interest rate, which is a simple annual interest rate, although your loan will likely mature sooner than one year. Now, because the interest rate you're quoted is an annual rate, you can calculate the periodic interest rate by multiplying your simple interest rate by the percentage of the year until that loan matures. For example, if we knew that a bank loan for $10,000 matured in nine months and had a 12% quoted annual interest rate, we could calculate the periodic interest rate by multiplying our APR, or annual percentage rate, which is our quoted rate, by the portion of the year until that loan matured, or nine divided by 12. So here's our formula that we'd use to get our periodic interest rate, it's just our APR times the number of months divided by 12. So if we have a loan outstanding for nine months, we just put nine here. And so that's exactly what we do to get our periodic interest rate. So if we have a, an annual interest rate or APR of 12% and we want to know our periodic interest rate, we just take that times 9 twelfths and that gets our 9% periodic interest rate. Now our APR on a simple interest loan, uh, that's, I mean, that quite frankly is always going to be our quoted rate. Uh, it's really just our periodic interest rate times well, we're gonna scale that periodic interest rate up to an annual rate, basically just doing the exact opposite of what I did here. Uh, but most of the time, when you get quoted the interest rate on a simple interest loan, that's going to be your APR directly. You don't have to do any of this stuff 
you know, scaling down, scaling up. Now our EAR in this case is just going to be calculated using the ER, the EAR formula that I have here, and that'll get us our uh, 1 plus our periodic interest rate of 0 0.09 to the power of 12 ninths because we're scaling up to a year and then subtracting 1 to get rid of the principal that I included here. And that gets us our EAR of 13.19. The next bank loan we have is the discount interest loan. And with this loan, the interest is calculated based on the principal and paid in advance. And let's take a look at an example. I'll just use the exact same example that I had in the previous slide. So our PER, or our periodic interest rate, is going to be calculated as, in our numerator, this is the amount that we're going to owe our lender. So we have a $10,000 loan. And we want to multiply that by our uh, amount that we're actually going to be paying to our lender. So 12% is our APR times 9 divided by 12. And that'll get us $900 that we're actually going to have to pay associated with this loan. And we're dividing that by our principal minus the amount of our principal that's not actually usable. So basically everything that is a cost. So this would be 10000 minus 900 And that gets us... Uh, this 0 0.0989 or 9.89%. Now our APR here is just going to be 9.89% times, well, 12 ninths because we're scaling up this nine-month loan to an annual loan. And that gets us our APR of 13.19. And our EAR is going to be calculated using that standard EAR formula. So 1 plus our PER of 0 0.0989 to the power of 12 ninths, because again, we're scaling up to a year and subtracting one, and that gets us our EAR of 13.4%. The final type of bank loan is the installment loan with add-on interest. And this loan involves us calculating interest that's added to the amount borrowed to obtain the total dollar amount to be paid back in equal installments. The periodic interest rate is the total add-on interest divided by the average loan balance. Now, I could show you an example here, but if you want to see an example, feel free to consult the book. I, I think maybe these examples get a little more complicated than what you would see on an exam. Now, let's talk about how to calculate the cost of commercial paper. Remember that commercial paper is the short-term debt issued by firms with high credit ratings, like Apple or Berkshire Hathaway. We use the same formulas as before, but the difference we need to consider with commercial paper is that commercial paper can come with transaction fees. The way we factor those fees in is by adding up the total costs over the period in the numerator of the periodic rate. All right, let's work through this example. So GM issues 270-day commercial paper with face value equal to $10,000. Again, the quoted interest rate is 12%, and the total transaction fee is 5 base or 50 basis points or 0.5 percent of the amount of the issuance now to get our periodic interest rate all we're going to do since this is a piece of commercial paper that matures in nine months because it's 270 day commercial paper is we're going to sum up the fee so the the total amount that we're going to have in interest and that's just our 9% rate times 10,000, which is where we get this 900. And we're going to add to that the transaction fee. And the transaction fee for this commercial paper is just going to be 0.5% times 10,000. That's where we get this 50. In the denominator, we're going to have the principal that we borrow minus the fees that we're going to be paying for that, for that issuance. So just our our quoted interest rate compensation to our, our lender plus the fee that we have to pay to borrow the money. And so our periodic interest rate is 10.5%. Our APR is just going to be that 10.5% scaled up to one year. So take 12 divided by nine since this is a nine month interest rate and that'll get us 14% APR. Finally, if we want to get our EAR, we're just going to take our periodic interest rate of 10.5%, add 1 to it, take it to the power of 12 ninths, and subtract 1 to get rid of the principal, and that'll get us an effective annual rate of 14.24%. All right, so let's summarize what we covered. First, 
The cash cycle represents the length of time funds are tied up in current assets. We can calculate the cash cycle along with the operating cycle if we want to. And you should know now what the impact a longer cash cycle has on a firm. The longer the cash cycle, the more outside financing the firm will need. Speaking of that outside financing, there are many ways to raise short-term financing, but each has their pros and cons. Finally, the percentage cost of credit factors in both the quoted rate and any fees that are being charged to you, the borrower. And we're going to divide that by the usable funds. So the principal minus any fees or interest you're paying to your, your lender. And that's that. So next, we'll come back and for the final lecture, I'll cover essentially how to manage accounts receivable. Uh, but with that being said, I will, uh, I'll end here. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out via email or phone, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you.